I want you to understand that this is a fight, that this is a war, and it's not just a war against the cultural left. It's those on our side who falsely claim that they're fighting on your behalf, but are simply saying to you what you want to hear and aren't willing to fight for what you believe in. Carrying on the legacy of Andrew Breitbart, this is Breitbart News Daily with your host, Alex Marlowe. On Sirius XM Patriot 125. Welcome back to Breitbart News Daily. I'm Alexander Marlowe, editor in chief of Breitbart.com. Final hour of this show for the week, so I always remind you we're on 38 hours live on Sirius XM Patriot, the only conservative station on Sirius XM. And all of those hours live on demand, commercial free on our app. Go to SiriusXM.com to get that. My favorite way to listen to the shows because you get no commercials. And also, we've got three live shows over the weekend Breitbart News Saturday, followed by Sunny's Corner, and then Breitbart News Sunday. All highly recommended. All right, we have Senator Tom Cotton on the line, who's been one of the leaders on China going back. Uh, it's really since as he's really the only person, I would say, in Washington where I feel like it might be ahead of me in some of this stuff and ahead of us at Breitbart. Senator, uh, this is incredible moment we're in. Thanks so much for joining me again on the show. And uh, I, I have to say you called this one how bad this was going to be. Uh, give us your thoughts on where we're at at the moment, and then I've got some specific questions. Hey, Alex, it's good to be on with you. Well, it's not one of those things you like to say you were right about. Um, but I could tell going back to mid-January when the first reports of a viral pneumonia of unknown origin emerged from China, that this would be severe and could be a global pandemic. And it's not because I'm a scientist or expert in epidemiology or anything else. It's two very simple observations. One, the Chinese Communist Party was lying blatantly about the virus. While two, it was undertaking the most draconian measures imaginable, you know, locking down 100 million people, uh, sometimes welding the doors short, shut to their apartments, canceling school, Hong Kong canceled flights from the mainland. Those two things together made it clear just how severe this virus might be. And and and, and the coincidental disappearance of whistleblowers, of course, right? Well, of course, and, and you know, so you know, you had doctors that were trying to blow the whistle, and they were visited by the secret police the next night. Tragically, one of them. Li Wenlong, was later stricken with the virus and died, leaving behind a pregnant wife and a young child. Uh, the laboratory in Beijing that released the genomic sequence that has allowed researchers around the world to try to develop therapeutics and vaccines and testing kits was shut down the very next day. Um, that's just a few of the ways in which the Chinese Communist Party turned what could have been a local health problem in Wuhan in December into a global pandemic that we face now. So, Senator, let's talk a little bit about uh, where we are in terms of some of the models, some of the projections. It looks like we're the projections and the models for how bad this is going to be in the United States. Uh, we're not quite seeing those numbers, though there are some regions, in particular New York City, that are really struggling at the moment. Uh, where do you feel like we are in terms of the health element? We'll get the financial element in, in a bit, but the health element, how are we doing from your vantage point? So, so Alex, I know there's a lot of debate about these models and about many of the key variables, which are still unknown. Just how infectious is this virus? How long can someone carry it and be contagious yet asymptomatic? What ultimately will be the mortality rate? We simply don't know those things, and we might not know them for a long time. But here's what we do know. We don't need models to see with our own two eyes what's happening in hospitals not just in places like Italy and Spain, but in New York. Um, they don't turn the Javits Convention Center in New York City into a field hospital for the flu. They don't bring refrigerated trucks to hospitals to back up the morgue for the flu. We don't have doctors working triple shifts for the flu. That's the case in New York, and unfortunately, I think it's going to be the case in, in more cities in the days ahead as our, as our health care system gets stretched to the limit. It's those simple observations, Alex, about what's happening on the ground, no matter what you think about models or fractions of cases versus hospitalizations versus deaths that tell us that it is critical that we continue the measures that are in place for as long as our healthcare systems are being stressed like this. I hope that's only a matter of a couple more, maybe three weeks, 
until we can build up the capacity we need in terms of personal protective equipment for doctors and nurses, respirator masks, ventilators, new field hospitals, and so forth. What we're doing now is not a long-term solution. It is simply a necessary short-term solution to prevent the healthcare system in major American cities from collapsing. Because if that happens, remember, it's not just a risk for people with the virus. It's a risk for anyone who needs intensive care, for people who've had a heart attack or a stroke or been in an accident and so forth. This is a crucial point and one I've made a lot, especially when the vast majority of people getting tested are not turning up that they have the virus, is that it is a lot of people are – it's even the concern is taking resources. So if you're – if you have coronavirus, obviously that's a drain on resources. Uh, And if you – even if you don't have it, that's some resources necessary just to test you uh, out. And this is all stuff that's coming away from the rest of our medical world. So uh, yes, there are ripple effects. There are dominoes that are falling. Uh, You gave a pretty stirring speech that we carried at Breitbart where it really was throwing some caution to the idea that we must rush into opening up the economy. I think everyone in this audience is uh, excited to get the economy moving again, but you urge some caution from the Senate floor this week. Uh, Give us in a nutshell why you're feeling that way and what is your recommended course of action right now? Sure, Alex. Uh, I I understand as much as anyone the desire to get the economy back on its feet and get people moving. No one wants to be cooped up in home. No one wants to lose their job. No one wants to see their retirement savings uh, decline. Um, At the same time, though, we have to recognize there are no simple solutions. And these two questions are related to the public health and the economic question. We can't have a strong economy if this virus is still tearing through our society and um, sending people home, sending people to hospitals, unfortunately, sending people to their death. Um, at the same time, our healthcare system is, you know, one sixth of our economy. We can't have a uh, healthcare system that uh, is surviving if those viruses um, are still ripping through our society. So we have to have a gradual, careful, calibrated approach and realize there are no simple answers. I know a lot of people are saying, well, Donald Trump needs to open it back up. Remember, President Trump didn't close anything down. Yeah, the CDC issues guidelines. But ultimately, those are not the decisions of the federal government in our constitutional system. Those are the decisions of governors and mayors. They made the decision to shut down a lot of basic retail in this country. But even that, Alex, probably overstates it. The governors and the mayors who have issued stay-at-home orders or shut down non-essential retail services, um, they were largely just following what was already happening in their communities. If President Trump, if a governor in a state said, you know what, let's open it back up, cures worse than disease, let's get back on our feet, would people really be going out to restaurants? Would they be going to movie theaters? Would they be taking their kids to indoor play places? Uh, I highly doubt it. Um, That's why it's so essential that we arrest the spread of the virus as part of getting the economy back on its feet. And what is that going to look like? Sure. It's going to be uh, much more widespread testing, um, kind of on-site testing. We've got a test now that takes 45 minutes. It's still a little bit too long in the practical world. So maybe getting that down to closer to where we are with the flu, you know, 15-minute testing or so. So you can test on-site, not even at a healthcare facility. Um, Very aggressive contact tracing. So once we have the spread of the virus arrested, if there are new cases, um, there has to be mandatory quarantining for those cases and very aggressive contact tracing of where those cases have been so we can identify Um, who else might be exposed to it. And then I also think we're going to rely heavily on our local authorities. Again, what's right for New York City is clearly not right what's right for Kansas City, and even more so what's right for Star City, Arkansas. So it has to be a a gradual kind of rolling, calibrated set of decisions in which our governors and our county executives and our mayors are making decisions just as much as the federal government is making those decisions. Yeah, that was my next question. We have to be prepared for that kind of thing to – that kind of thing to last for, for several months, not, uh, not the total halt, yes. but the kind of gradual rolling ca- calibration because you don't want to have a resurgent of the virus, as you've now unfortunately started to see in Hong Kong and Singapore, which had been two world leaders. Yeah, certainly. And this is where I was going to go next, which is, uh, do you recommend an approach that would differ from community to community? It sounds like that's where the president's going. That makes perfect sense to me, because if you have a place like New York, where people are literally on top of each other, and it's so globalized, and there's so many international people coming in and out, that's going to be a different approach than rural middle America. That's right, Alex. Um, There has to be a calibrated approach. Um, So New York's the densest city in the world, or densest city in America. Um, 
you know, regrettably, it had direct flights from Wuhan for much of December and January. So it's not surprising that New York has had the earliest and the fastest outbreak. I, I unfortunately think that most communities across America are going to see some kind of outbreak in their communities. We've had a lot of small rural towns in Arkansas who've had a few cases, but hopefully it'll just be a few cases. And the kind of measures that you see in New York will not be necessary in places like rural Arkansas. Again, that's a decision, though, that, that has to be made primarily at the state and the local level. Our governor, Asa Hutchinson, and our county judges and our mayors are following guidance from the CDC. That's valuable guidance. But in the end, they are elected by their local communities and our state to make those decisions for our people. And they've been doing a great job in Arkansas, and I've got confidence not only in them, but in our local officials all around the country. But you're going to have to take into account local conditions as well when you're thinking about getting the economy back on its feet. Yeah, certainly. And some of this is going to be gradual, even if it's self-imposed. You mentioned bringing kids to indoor play places, which is um, uh, I have a dark smile going because that was the first part of my routine that I quashed. You know, I didn't need any guidance say, well, we're not going to bring the kids and drop them in a ball pit uh, right now with a bunch of other strangers. Like, that's not going to happen. So that was the first thing to go in my life. So, And that's going to go on for a while. And so the focus then shifts next to the economy. And there's a huge bill that you guys passed unanimously uh, in the Senate. It's now headed to the House. This audience, which is a very conservative audience, um, is concerned about pork. Does do things go too far? They, of course, everyone wants money in the hands of Americans right now. Uh, are you happy with the approach, or are there any things that you're still concerned about as the House considers it? Well, Alex, no bill, especially a bill that spends two two trillion dollars, is perfect. But uh, because this bill started in the Senate, started in the hands of Republicans, um, you know, kind of the rank and file member uh, uh, level. Uh, is much better than the bill that was passed two weeks ago that came from Nancy Pelosi's house. Um, And what all of your listeners should know is the vast majority of this money is going to be spent on individuals and on small businesses. So for individuals, if you made less than $75,000 or a married couple made less than $150,000 in the 2018 tax year, you're going to be getting a check for $1,200 a person and $500 a person for each child you have. So a typical family of four in a couple of weeks, you're going to be receiving a check for $3,400. Um, and then if you, unfortunately, you lost your job, which more than 3 million Americans did last week, and I'm afraid we're going to see a couple more weeks of similar numbers, you're going to get not just your typical unemployment benefit, but a significantly enhanced one for the next four months as well. Uh, again, that doesn't replace a job. This is not a stimulus package, in my opinion. This is a survival package. This is designed to get distressed families on the back side of this crisis. So in the meantime, they can continue to put food on the table for their children. They can keep a roof over their kids' heads. They can pay the bills so they don't have to worry uh, about falling behind and facing economic ruin when we do get the economy back on its feet. The second part, big part of the bill is for businesses. We want businesses, whether it's the local dry cleaner or the pizza shop or the big manufacturer on the outskirts of town, to keep workers connected to their workforce. Again, these were strong healthy, thriving businesses with great workers just 45 or 60 days ago. They did nothing wrong. They're not at fault. They are fundamentally strong businesses. They were just afflicted by the same virus that is afflicting all of us. So we're saying to businesses, here are loans, and if you'll use these loans to keep workers on payroll, to keep your workforce intact, then down the road, we'll waive those loans for you. Those those are the two core parts of the bill. Crucial. Senator Tom Cotton is my guest, Republican from Arkansas, and he is also the uh, one of the leaders on China. And your colleagues have been quite excellent on this issue, as Senator. You're on the Republican side, and uh, a lot of the focus. And I've had a couple senators on this week. Uh, the people want to hold China accountable, and they want to get us off of our China addiction. Uh, and I know this is something that you have. A, you have a bill that you're that you have out there that would work on this right away. Talk to us a little bit about what what your vision is. Yeah, well, well Alex, I think it's important to set the premise for this. I, Occasionally, on television, we see people laying blame on politicians for this virus. Some folks on CNN want to blame Donald Trump. You know, some people want to blame this or that governor for going too far, not going far enough. Same thing with the mayors. That's not to say any of them have made every decision correctly, but just remember, none of those people are to blame for this situation. The virus is to blame, and the virus is the responsibility of the Chinese Communist Party for covering it up and not getting ahead of it in December and unleashing it on the world. That's why there has to be a reckoning with China, and we've got to stop our dependence on China, 
especially for critical goods. It's one thing to have lawn furniture or toys made in China. It's another thing to have our most basic and essential pharmaceuticals. Most Americans, until this virus hit, didn't realize that we were totally dependent on China for things like antibiotics and penicillin, ibuprofen, acetaminophen. So that has to change. Legislation I've introduced with Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin is going to solve that problem. So first, it both creates a market for U.S.-made pharmaceuticals by saying the federal government uh, agencies that purchase drugs, Medicare, Medicaid, the military, the VA, and others can only buy American-made products. It gives incentives to build that manufacturing capability here. So, for instance, by letting companies write off the expense of building a new factory in terms of building the, um, the structures and buying the equipment and so forth. But then it also has the stick, which says, if you're in China, you're going to have to get out, period. Um, so that's just the most urgent and critical kind of need we have to bring back life-saving manufacturing from China. It's going to have to be much broader than that, though. We can't continue to depend on China for anything that is critical to our nation. That's a terrible mistake we've made over the last 30 years. Most Americans realize it's time to rectify that mistake. So essential. Senator, last question for today. Uh, Do you have any thoughts on America's media in this? Because I just read way too much uh, of uh, Americans parroting Beijing propaganda. That they just don't understand that they're not getting the truth, and so much of it is just parroted back to us as if it's true. Uh, you're you're an observer of these things. What do you think? Yeah, it's very disappointing to see the number of mainstream media outlets that simply repeat Chinese Communist propaganda. I mean, it, whenever the Chinese Communist Party has their ambassadors around the world, literally in almost every nation in the world, telling those governments. Oh, the American military is responsible for this virus. It didn't come from China. Or, oh, we're going to provide all this aid when the aid, in fact, has strings attached or it's defective. And then our mainstream media wants to criticize Donald Trump or me or others for calling it the China virus or the Wuhan coronavirus, when, in fact, they are the ones responsible. Um, it, it's really disappointing. Now, that there are some notable exceptions, and even some of the institutions that you and I hold in most disfavor, do important work. You know, I would commend to your readers a great feature from the New York Times last Sunday that visualized the move of this virus from Wuhan across China and then across the world. It really kind of crystallizes what the Chinese Communist Party did. But too often, our mainstream media outlets are uh, apologists for the Chinese Communist Party, much like Walter Durante was for the Soviet Union back in the last century. It's a great point. Uh, Sadly, I agree with you. Senator, thanks so much for the time, and we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you, Alex. Senator Tom Cotton, at Senator Tom, at Sen Tom Cotton on Twitter, S-E-N Tom Cotton. He's got one of the the good Twitter accounts out there in the Senate as well, so you should check that out. And we'll be right back with your calls.